So you're welcome again to uh, the first session of the 2022 Emerging Managers Program. And uh, I'm Nelson Okuna, I'm a director with Heart and Heart Foundation and the CEO of Octavio Development Company. It's my pleasure, great pleasure to have you here with us. And uh, we'll, I can see we already have a diverse pool of participants. We we'll expect that the bulk of uh, the class will join later and watch the, this video later, uh, perhaps either on uh, YouTube or on Zoom or through the Telegram platform. Now, today we're gonna to discuss two things today. I'm gonna to handle the first session, which is introducing you to the Magic Managers Program, and then um, introduce the cost of business as mission, and then shed more light on how we're gonna flow for the rest of uh, the duration of this course. Later today, Mr. Manuel Tafa, one of our speakers, the, this profile has, has also been shared, will come and teach us some core principles of personal development, how to be the kind of person you ought to be. Emmanuel is also a very distinguished uh, management consultant in Lagos that uh, consult for relatively large firms. You could check their, his profile as well. I would like you to be expectant for that particular session. Now, I'm going to start shooting. I'm introducing the concept of business as mission. I'll try and make this as interactive as possible. If you are not hearing me, please raise your hand and let me know. If you, are, if you have, um, if I'm moving too fast, also let me know. When we use the word BAM, business as mission, we are referring to a philosophy. We are referring to a set of thinking. And that's what we're going to do here today because Emerging Managers Program is guided by that BAM philosophy. How do I make my business? How do I make my operation in the marketplace like that, like a mission? I mean, a mission to God, not personal mission, but a mission to God. Remember, uh, the Heart and Heart Foundation is a Christian organization, and our goal is to raise uh, young men and women who will be the best they can be in the marketplace, representing Christ and also being proficient in their calling. So it's not just about being a Christian, it's about being an effective marketplace leader. Now, the outline, we're going to look at five things, the concept and history of business as mission, the goal of the emerging managers program, the kingdom of God and the goal of enterprise, the essentials of value creation, which we're going to spend more time on, maybe let's time in a different session, and we'll discuss stewardship and stakeholders in the business process. Now, if... As I'm talking, just to give me some encouragement, feel free to make comments on the, uh, on the uh, group chats. Let me have an idea that you are following. It will really help uh, the flow of our conversation. And uh, if you raise any question on the uh, platform, on Telegram, uh, Deborah and the rest of the team will be able to um, observe and bring that to my attention. Not just for me, but for every of our resource persons, please feel free to uh, interrupt in the course of the session and shed, uh, shed light on whatever you think uh, needs to be emphasized or further clarified. I also encourage um, Deborah to please share this link again on the platform. I don't think everybody has access to the link so that they can also join. Now, I'm gonna move a little bit faster. So when we say business as mission, I don't know if anybody has heard this term before, or is aware of this term, and you like to shed some light as to what you understand. Maybe I should ask Mr. Nambe Chinere. Have you heard this before? This term? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, you, you have. Yeah, business of the I didn't hear that you said. Yes, I did. Okay, can you tell us what you understand by that, please? If you don't mind, to speak a bit louder, it would help. Okay, um, business as a concept, basically talking about the idea, the idea or the originality of the business. I think that's much I can start with. No, 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 I, I'm saying business as mission. Have you heard that term before? Business as mission, that concept before? Okay, fine. Let me concentrate. As a mission, basically talking about the... No, no, no. I, I, okay, I, I don't want you to uh, take a go at it. I'm just asking if you are used to the concept of business as mission before now. Yes, I've heard that. Okay, go ahead, please. 
Okay, she's talking about the mission of any, any business. You know that any any given business, there must be a mission where the business is heading to. So that is the mission of or targets of that particular business. Mission. I see. Okay, now the saying is that that every every business has a mission. So a business has a mission. You know what? The engagement of that business is a missional activity in itself. Okay, that's a, a, a modern uh, perspective and it's valid, actually. However, we are seeing it differently. We are referring to the way you have a missionary. You know, the way you have a, a missionary that says, I'm a missionary to Adamawa, I'm a missionary to Bombay, I'm a missionary to Abuja. That is where we are looking at business. That business as a mission is demonstrating what the kingdom of God is like in the context of business. And as we do, engaging with the world's more pressing social, economic, environmental, and, and spiritual issues. So it's not just that concept of uh, doing your business as a mission. No, it's the concept of doing business as a mission to God, as a Christian mission. You understand? So it involves a missionary impulse, you know? So there's a hybrid component. You know? So it's not about making money, but it's not also embarrassed about making money, you know? So it's a bit difficult to classify this uh, according to Steve Rondo or Bill University, you know? So, but the, the, what is central to the concept of business as mission is the kingdom of God is prioritized. So there's no relatively uh, um, easy definition of this, but the, the, the point is that it's about people who are in business for the glory of God alone. So our goal as a Magic Managers program is to provide the training and mentorship components of business incubation services required to raise bishops in the marketplace. And I'm going to explain that later. What is a bishop? A bishop is an overseer, someone that has the oversight over certain resources, certain human beings, and it's influencing those people to achieve a particular cause. An overseer is a bishop. So when we say bishop of the market, we're referring to those who are exerting influence all for the glory of God alone. In Latin, we say solidio gloria. So at EMP, we are seeking to cultivate managers that could manage an investment because every business manager is managing an investment eventually at every level. You are managing other resource, finance, you know, that kind of stuff. So our goal is to ensure that you can come to the higher, upper most echelon of management, which is to be like yourself, that the, the Pharaoh, your master, is able to entrust everything to you. You get, it might be a couple of, of the business, it could be an investment, it could be, um, it could be a, a department, it could be uh, a company, but let it be that you should be able to see end to end of a business that you have perfect understanding and you know what to do, that's our goal. Because that is how you can exact that influence. That is how you can bring about uh, changing influence in the marketplace. You must be someone who can be entrusted with resources. I don't know if I'm communicating. Yes, sir. So our goal essentially is to our, we can measure our performance by how able you, you now, you Namdi now, you Chisum, how able you are are you to attend to this objective of being a manager in three years' time? That's the only way we can measure our performance. Arida, we're making sense. Uh, sorry, don't mind me, I'll be calling names as I'm talking. Ifoma, we're making sense, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, you are. Okay, so our target participants, that is you now, if I'm a YouTube Akuchuku, we know you are already interacting with God's promises in a way. You know what? You are responsible, you believe that you have a calling, God is talking to you, you should be in business, you know, you may have some management experience, you know, but you must have had that sense of calling, that sense of oh, I'm important in, in the scheme of things. I have a role to play in this whole uh, shebang, you know. Um Jeremiah Richard, I'm sure you have this sense that, oh, uh, you have something to do in the marketplace. Our job is simple, to find you, to water that seed 
with a deep sense of urgency. So the goal of this program is to help you understand the business of God in your life, your role in divine agenda, and to develop the attitude and skill sets required to achieve that objective. That's our goal. Simple. And in the, at the end, by September, yes, at the end of the uh, program, you should have to tell us if we achieved that objective of, or not. Now, the kingdom of God is the summation of the influences of God our Father and the King. And it encompasses the entirety of reality. Now, so some of I'm wondering, hey, Nelson, I thought we came for business later. You're discussing kingdom of God and God of other fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the beginning. We must let the foundation rise. You know? If the foundation is wrong, we cannot build jack. So our goal this afternoon is to lay the foundation, right? Now, the kingdom of God is the summation of the influences of God our Father and the King, and it encompasses the entirety of reality. It includes its influence in every area of reality, physical, spiritual, ethics, morals, principles, business. In other words, God's kingdom rules in the affairs of men, in the entirety of reality. So God's kingdom rules in business, right? The kingdom of God is the ultimate pursuit to which every believer is called. The Bible says that seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Dr. Thomas Muro, later Thomas Muro put it this way, said, a kingdom is not a democracy, a republic, or a religion. It is the governing influence of the king over his territory, impacting it with his will, purposes, and intentions. We will see the citizen of people who reflect the culture of the king and manifest the nature of the king. So in God's kingdom, God is the king and he wants to rule the governing influence of, it, of the king. So in other words, how can I run my business? How can I run a management under my watch that the kingdom of God can be seen in its entirety? That is our goal. That is our mission. This is not going to be easy. This is not going to be achievable in one day. But it is possible. It's our goal. It's our pursuit. So reflect God's kingdom. But, but to say, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on heaven and earth other, as it is in heaven. That's our goal. That's our objective. Now, let me just say for a that this kingdom of God a little bit more. The nature of the king this is glory. You will get this lecture notes. You get these materials. Every material shared on this slide, you will get it. However, listen carefully and take your notes, for you will get these materials. God wants to fill the earth with his full nation. Religion produces a system. The kingdom produces a culture, a lifestyle that is natural, that reflects the culture of the king. Our goal is not to please God, our goal is to be like God. When we say solid your glory, and for the glory of God alone, we are referring to the revelation of his full nation. The nation of the king is his glory. Jesus Christ said, let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Say, let thy glory, thy nation, be fully known on earth. That should be known, not known. Known. Fully known. Let that great dimension be fully known. So, key considerations now. In the marketplace, in your business, what is the will and nature or glory of God? And what are the ways you, Nande, in your work, in your future work, Jeremiah, Richard, Akuchuku, Chisum, Ifoma, Odum, how can you review the nature of God in the marketplace? That is the key consideration. What is that will? What is that nation of God? How can you reveal it? That's our purpose. That, that's what we're going to be deliberating on. Let me dig deeper a little bit. Let me make a distinction. I said, you need difference between social entrepreneurship and business as mission. However, on the surface, this difference is very subtle. Social entrepreneurs want to do good for their fellow man. Whereas, bummers, people who are in business for God's kingdom, 
are motivated ultimately by a desire to serve God and draw people's attention to him. In other words, at the end of the day, people will be involved, but it is God first. Do you understand? You know, you cannot love God and don't love your neighbor, right? You know, that's not possible, right? But you also cannot, you can also, but you can also love your neighbor and not love God. Is that possible? Yes, it is possible. You can, you can love your neighbor and don't love God. Our goal is to love God and through that our love for God, love our neighbor. So that is the difference. The difference is that at the heart of it is God. You see this diagram a little bit more. Why, what, and how. That was the first thing is why are you in business? Why are you a manager? Why are you in enterprise? Why are you in the marketplace to just meet your needs, to just pay your bills? Why? What is your motivating reason? What is your primary reason? That primary reason <coughs> should be the glory of God. Like I said, the Christ centered nature of BAM is a significant difference. Now, who is my neighbor? Because at the end of the day, you are loving God, but you are loving God in isolation. You are loving Him and you are loving your neighbor. C.S. Lewis, if you've not read C.S. Lewis, I suggest that you read him. He's a very good author, one of the best authors ever in the world, not just in uh, Christian theology, but ever in the world. If you've not read anything about C.S. Lewis, I suggest that you please read him. If you buy any of his books and you don't like it, they talk to me, I'll balance with the money. I tell you, if you buy any sensible books and you don't like the book, give me, I'll, I'll send you the money. He, he, he wrote this, he said, there are no ordinary, there are no ordinary um, uh, people. You have not talked to a mere mortal. Say nations, cultures, arts. Sorry, hold on. I don't know if you are hearing uh, that notification message. You shouldn't let me off it. Sorry. Okay. You won't hear that again. Okay. So let me continue. He said, There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a male mortal. The nations, cultures, and civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of the gnats. But it is immortals whom we joke with, walk with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. What that first part is saying is that everybody you are meeting is immortal. Everybody you are going to serve or work with is immortal. We don't die. We just change. In other words, we don't die. We die physically, but our spirit never die. So we are either everlasting splendors or we are immortal horrors. So in other words, everybody you are seeing and, and dealing with is an eternal being. So it should be taken very, 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 very seriously. He now said, it's a powerful statement here. He said, next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. He said, if he or she is your Christian neighbor, he or she is holy in almost the same way. For in him also, Christ, the Latita, that's the Latin, to be glorified and the glorified, God himself is truly hidden. Do you hear that? That's powerful. Since Lewis is saying that your neighbor is immortal, your neighbor represents Chinese God, your neighbor has the nature of God, your neighbor is, is the closest resemblance of God that you ever uh, have. So what that means is that your love for your neighbor is a huge part of your act of worship. So your love for your neighbor is a massive part of your worship. So in B in Bam, 
we are intentional and integrated. It has been combined in different ways. However, in contemporary times, it represents a growing intentionality in the global church to, inf to fully integrate business goals with the call to the whole church to take the whole gospel to the world. It is an answer to the prayer, may your kingdom come on earth as it's in heaven, as people and communities are positively transformed through for-profit business activities. BAM is the intentional integration of business and mission. And that will mean Christian mission. Just think about this for a moment. Any question thus far? Any question? Hello, any questions? Any questions? If I don't get a question, I'm supposing that I've been talking to myself for... Or have I? No question for me, sir. I'm scared though. This is why I don't ask you anything though. Okay, I'm seeing comments. Okay, we should say no question. Someone said no question for okay. Let's move. Thank you. That's a, that's a good feedback. Okay. Now, I've heard about tent making. Has anybody heard about tent making? Tent making? Anybody who has heard about tent, uh, tent making? Okay. Nobody. Okay. Tent making is a popular stuff, actually. I'm surprised you've even heard about it. Ah, someone said real estate. <laughs> ah, no, that's not real estate. <laughs> tent making is a Christian concept in some circles. What it means is that someone, uh, let's say, at a medical doctor now, for example, I, I go to, I'm a, I'm a pharmacist, by the way. I'm not a medical doctor. I, I, I'll just give an example. A medical doctor, I travel to, let's say, Pakistan. To practice medicine, but my real goal of going there is to do ministry. That's tent making. When you take a job, whereas the real goal is something bigger. So tent making basically is taking a job, but for the bigger purpose of promoting the kingdom. That's tent making. It was based on the missionary model of the Apostle Paul and his friends, Priscilla and Aquila. These guys we are businessmen. Someone said it's this. It's not really this. <laughs> Mission experts began playing with this idea that one's professional skills can be used as instruments to advance God's kingdom, particularly in less Christianized countries. The focus was evangelism, and business and work was the instrument. You know, was my goal is to be evangelist and a missionary at heart. That's who I am, but. I want to go under the cover of business. Tent makers also have a sponsoring ministry of <coughs> church. So, there's a lot of wisdom to, the concept, to this concept of tent making. Apostle Paul chose to walk even though he didn't have to, clearly. Though he received support from the Philippian church, he definitely earned his own way in Corinth, Ephesus, and Thessalonica. He believed self-support was an integral part of his strategy. He believed it added credibility to his message. He created a model for his converts to follow. So tent making, you know, Apostle Paul was a tent maker. Yes, yes, Odun, yes. Is that Odun? Yes, Odun, yes. So, um, Abishnari escaped in Nigeria, they were tent makers. So, that was what they, they did. That was tent making in action. Tent making is that you are going underground, but the goal is the kingdom, or you come as another 
you know, another, another business, but your goal is the kingdom. Please, can you give me a minute, please? Just a minute. I'll be with you shortly. Just move a little bit on what we have said and uh, shoot on it. I will pause the recording and uh, I'll be with you in a minute. Okay, I'm back. Now, we would have a break at five o'clock, assuming you want to do something, a 15 minute break at five, then come back and rush up to six. Now, remember Apostle Paul, Priscilla and Aquila, they were tent makers. So that is the concept people are, you know, people embrace as a particular time. And I still have met a lot of uh, tent makers. Okay, I just got feedback that my voice is not so clear. Can you confirm that my voice is not so clear? Anybody else having that same challenge? Or is it the network of the person that gave the comments? Let's know. To me, the voice is clear. To me, the voice is clear. Anybody else with an issue of my voice not being clear? No. The voice is clear. Uh, I guess it's an issue of network on their side. Okay. And the person that commented, you heard, right? They said it's your network. Okay. Thank you, Namde Bacho. Thank you, former. Thanks a lot. Okay. So I will I will post my video once in a while just to help those that don't have good network. Okay. So Apostle Paul gave us a model to work with, and that is the tent making, essentially. Now, business as mission is a, a step further than tent making. It is tent making plus, you know, <laughs> version two of tent making. Now, it arose in the late 90s at a pair of conferences focused on the redemptive potential of Christian managed business in Central Asia. So, initially, it was like tent making, it was self supporting, loyalty driven. However, it focused exclusively on business, not on employment. So I could go as a do doctor working, I'm an employed person, but BAM is business. Business, business, business. You know? BAM promoters can find that the economic and social transformation of nations and society by business was missional in itself. Note that the economic and social transformation of nations and societies by business was missional in itself. According to the band theologians, to the extent that our work and our business contribute to the common good, our work is missional and sacred and pleasing to God. I repeat, to the extent that our, our secular work, our businesses, contribute to the common good, our work is missional and sacred and pleasing to God. They believe that by encouraging lay people to leave the marketplace to go to a more narrowly defined ministry, the church undermines its global impact. We tell people like Daniel, Joseph, David, that they are not in the ministry. Do you, do you get that? Hello. You got that? That mm -hmm. emphasis? Yes, we did, sir. Yeah. So, the, the defending ministry as being on the pulpit is restrictive. And oh, what are you? If, I, if I want to say something. If I okay. No, sir. Okay. okay. So that that definition of ministry as pulpit is restrictive. And when the church takes that definition, we undermine our global impact. So by 2004, the Lausanne Committee for World Evangelization mm -hmm. identified BAM as an important new development in world mission. And they brought 70 persons from the world, around the world, to discuss this in Thailand in 2020. 2004. The official document that was 
uh, software that was developed states this. Business is a mission, a calling, a ministry in its own right. It goes on to say that ultimately churches, mission agencies, and kingdom businesses have the same purpose to bring glory to God's name among all nations. So does that make sense? Okay. So, what are the elements of BAM? <laughs> the person that is marking this thing on my slide, you should delete it to. What are the components of, of, of BAM? One, profitable and sustainable business. That's number one. Number two, intentional about the purpose of the kingdom of God and its impact on people and nations. Number two, profitable, sustainable, <laughs> intentional about the kingdom of God and its impact on people. In other words, this business owner or business team member or business manager, we must make profits, but we must also impact people. For the kingdom is focused on holistic transformation and the multiple bottom line of economic, social, environmental, and spiritual outcomes. In other words, we have made visual performance by this criteria. It is concerned about the world's poorest and the least evangelized people. The Bible says, Give to the poor. The poor you always have to give them. It's a missionary calling. It's a holy calling. It's a sacred requirement. It's not something that we will do uh, if we feel like it's a calling. Love your neighbor. He said, if somebody comes to you hungry and you tell them, go, be filled, that faith. He said, what kind of love is that? What kind of faith is that? So it's a holistic approach. Kingdom, and kingdom is not one thing. Kingdom is everything. The rulership of God. Don't forget that. Now, BAM is a caution. BAM is a caution. So BAM is not just a theory that we're propagating or a worldview. It's actually a caution. A caution is the ideas, customs, and social behavior of a particular people or society. It is the shared patterns of behavior and interactions. Caution is the ideas, customs, social behavior, and patterns of people society. It is the shared patterns of behavior and interactions. Caution is what we do, not just what we say. You got that? Caution is what we do, not what we say. In other words, bam, it's about caution. You can see this picture now. Can somebody tell me? What can you see from this picture? Any ideas? Like a war tribe. Okay. Can you see that they have the same kind of hair? Yes, kind of and they are dressed in the same way. Okay. What else? They have animal skin. They have animal skin. What else? Shows that it's like they are ready for war. They are war guys. What else? You saw the red marks on their body. Yeah. Their shoes are the same. So the point is this. We can be doing several things. We are separate people. You can be in a pharmacy, I mean, um, uh, real estate. You can be uh, anywhere you are. Um, uh, you might be an employer, you might be employed, or can have the same caution. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. If we practice BAM as we ought to, we can have the same caution, even though we are different. BAM is a caution. 
And that culture is what we are trying to uh, achieve. Now, we're going to have a break. Now, in this break, normally we do a breakout session. We put in different groups. Um, so I'm trying, I'm going to attempt to do that to break us at random. Um, Deborah, you can help me to, uh, let's do, um, a, I'm trying to do, so I can have a different group. In that group, let us discuss what is this BAM caution and what, um, what this uh, means in a typical organization. If you use this as a case study, Deborah, I think you can actually share my slide on the group on the platform so that uh, in case we break up and people can't see this, they can use that. Did you hear that? Yes, sir. Noted, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Can you hear me, sir? I can hear you. So we are creating okay, two rooms sir. and Zoom to assign you automatically. So that will happen now. So once you get to your group, uh, join your group and discuss this question. What would this culture of price look like in your organization? Just take five minutes as you're doing that. Take a break, refresh yourself, drink water. I'll be back in 15 minutes. I'll, I'll keep it on, but I would uh, stop the recording. Session starts now. Let me figure out from group one. What do you think that BAM culture would mean in your organization? You can unmute your, your video if you want to speak. If not, you can leave it, it off. Can I? Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay, so I, what's the, you are in my group, right? Sorry, group one. Uh, I'm not so sure. Yes, anymore. yes, I will. Okay, okay. So thank God for his insight. I, according to us, though. Know, he said that it means that our way of life should be should translate that we are Christians and we should be led by what we believe in. In our works, our places of business, we should champion uh, the business as a mission. And from that, I, I perceive that it means that we should be careful and thank God for the contribution of the other persons there. It was really helpful that we should be careful in our walks with our neighbors and show love rather than bring about hostility and division amongst us so that there'll be a union of purpose, uh, a learning of each other patiently. And this takes, this does not, uh, it does not, uh, it's not ignorant of everybody's weakness or even your weakness. It takes into cognition people's weaknesses, but does not load it. It doesn't use it to intimidate. Rather, it's, it's, it invokes a power of persuasion mm -hmm. to a point that they they will want to be like you. They will want to know uh, uh, and and walk in your pattern for them. So that's what I think. So thank you very much, Namdi. Any other comments from Group One? Kimna I want to say something. Okay, let's go to group two. Tina if you want to say something, go ahead. Okay, group two, Omar Wumi, please go ahead. Okay, hello everyone. Okay, for us in group two, we yeah. agree that a, an organization that has the BAM culture infused in it, the key thing is you see it in the attitude of the employees and the ethics they will uphold, sincerity, integrity, empathy, excellence at delivering services, 
and knowing their onions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. We are making progress. Like I already said, um, it's about things like empathy, things like not uh, lording it over others, things like taking, being cognizant of the fact that uh, people are at, the, at different levels, right? Uh, being self-aware, you know, uh, maintaining the cause of Christ, not, you know, you can't, you can't afford to be a saint in church and at, at, at office you're a tiger. You get a kind of something. You know, they will, they will hear a word for you. <laughs> so this is business, so, you know, do you understand my point? There can't be a dichotomy between your Sunday and your Monday. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does, it does make that, sense. The same way you are at church on Sunday, fire, fire, holy, everything, you know, your clients should see you and have that sense of feeling. Your boss, your employees, People working with you should see you and have that sense that oh, this is a holy man. Do you understand? Or this is a holy woman. Yes, we do. Yes, you can't you can't be holy on Sunday and then every other day you are a tiger. You know. So the bank culture is be is being able to maintain the nature of God particularly from Monday to Saturday and not just on on Sunday. Now, I'm going to move a bit faster because I really want us to take a break before the 6 p.m. lecture comes. Mr. Tafa is one of the uh, distinguished uh, young men, and I, I suggest that you read his profile before he comes on board. Uh, however, um, and I want him to meet us eager and excited. Please, I want all of us to be here. If possible, let's even add more persons before he comes. Now, the goal of enterprise. In the traditional business setting, the goal of enterprise is to grow shareholders' wealth. That is the goal of enterprise. The traditional setting to grow shareholders' wealth. In every self -rest, I'm going to move all of us. I'm hearing too much by that man. Okay. Is, the goal of enterprise is to grow shareholders' wealth. Businesses exist. If you go to any self -rest, certain business school, that's one of the first things they'll teach you. And the goal of enterprise is to grow shareholders' wealth. And who is the shareholder? In brackets, the, uh, the, the people that own stock, primary stock. That is the goal of enterprise. However, within the BAM culture, it is for the kingdom of God, for the kingdom and the glory of God. But, but what does this mean? I will say what it means. It's about influencing people, influencing societies, influencing our neighbors, and all that. So, in other words, as a BAM practitioner, you are thinking about, am I changing people? Are we making, are we being profitable? You know, are we, um, are we helping the poor? Are, are we uh, achieving uh, spiritual growth in the life of people working with us? Am I influencing my colleagues positively for Jesus? You know, this must be within, this must be your goal post. In other words, if at the end of the year you make so much money, but all the people working with you and now smoking ganja. Do you understand? <laughs> Under the BAM culture, you have, lost, you have lost that year. Your balance sheet is negative. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Nandu. Makes sense, right? So uh, I cannot drive profit at the expense of my other bottom line. That is essentially what this means. So I'm about to ask you a question. Okay, sir. Is the kingdom of God averse to wealth? No, sir. What of the gospel of the camel and the needle? You know, I say that rich man cannot right, enter. Be difficult. Yes, it's just like a, a camel to enter the eye of a needle. What does that mean? Right. Any explanations? Or don't uh, anybody you can take a, 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 a shot at it, please. Okay. All right. Um, Hello. Somebody say something. Are we speaking? Just say I'm okay. speaking in prayer. Yeah. Okay, sir. Um, I was going to answer that the kingdom of God is not averse to wealth. Okay. And the gospel of the camel and the needle is essentially about wealth owning a man rather than him owning wealth. Um, okay. I think Jesus meant. 
explain that um, any person that is owned by wealth or the pursuit of it will be difficult to from because in the kingdom, God is the provider. Um, that's off the top of my head. Though. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wanda. Any other person? You can raise your hand. If you go that way, I'll call you. Ugo Oban, what do you think? Is the gospel advanced to wealth? Because we're, we're going to discuss money a lot in this session, so a lot of numbers, business, you know, this is just, this is like the easiest lecture we're going to have. No, it isn't. Why do you say so? Because money sponsors the gospel. Okay. 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 Another perspective, Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Who is that? Tinecherem. Tinecherem. Go ahead. Go All right. Ahead. About the rich man and uh, uh, the needle. Yes. All right. Now, something is difficult doesn't mean it's possible. Mm. It can be difficult and very, very possible. Mm. Thank you so much. That's my contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Kansas didn't say it's impossible. He just said that it's difficult, right? And uh, like Mr. Walker said, to trust in riches is the problem, not riches in itself. Because Abraham was rich, Job was the richest man, and he was also the most righteous man. Um, uh, David was also rich. You know, so uh, we have a history of wealth. Do you understand? We have a history of enterprise, of a, a history of entrepreneurship, of a history of businessmen within the common world of the kingdom, right? So the gospel cannot be advanced to worlds. However, what Christ was saying is that the trust in riches. Now, this might not be as easy as it seems when I just say it here, because in trying to make money, you are going to encounter the risk of avarice. You're going to encounter the desire to cut corners, you're going to encounter desire to do what to cut down. Then the kingdom, that is when, you know, it now becomes clear to you that mastering mammon is not as easy as it first appears, right? But don't just, it's good enough for now to just stress that the kingdom of God is not about to money. So to manifest the kingdom of the marketplace is to know the king, is to exercise his specific intents for our lives, and to exercise his specific intents for our world. Know the king, his intents for your life and his intents for our world. Now, the intent is that for some of us, we have been called to the marketplace. And the assumption is that if you are here, you have been called. Namdi, Chine Cherem, Odum, the assumption we have made, we made, Fariba, Ifo, Minosen, James, Julian, Kende, Monday, Morris, Namde. The assumption, Jeremiah, Samuel, Akintaro, who go about is that you have been called to the marketplace. You have been called to have influence in the business arena, in the public sector. And this man before us this afternoon is a key example of what we are referring to. William Wilberforce, in 1787, at the age of 28, he wrote this, that God Almighty has set before me two great objects, the suppression of slave trade and the reformation of manners. That was his goal. That was his calling. At the age of 28, he wrote this. However, when he was 21, he was just a playboy. However, he repented at 85. 1785, when he was just 26 years old. His goal was to resign from the British Parliament and pursue a more holy calling. Holy, let me put my camera so you can see me. Holy, in inverted commas, a more holy calling. So it was go, well, let me leave ministry, let me leave parliament, let me just go and do ministry. This parliament thing, we are speaking too much English. That was his goal at the time, right? But thankfully, he met John Newton, person that, that wrote, Amazing Grace, you know, how sweet that sound. 
and they are little told him, stay on in the parliament, stay in politics, and there you will find God's way for your life. He stayed on, and two years later, he wrote what I just read now, that God has said before me two great objects, slave trade and manners reformation. He now became the champion of slave trade abolition in the UK. It took him a long time, but as of 1933, when he was about 74 years old, just some few days before his death, at 74 years old, the Slavery Abolition Act was enacted. So, some say that his eyes had indeed seen the salvation of the Lord. He achieved his objective. My point, that is a calling. That could be your calling. It could be your calling. I don't know what God has called you to. But God has called this guy, and for him, it was at the parliament. The summary of what we are saying, and we're asking you, is there a specific call on your life? And the answer is that yes. As a call on your life, God has given us talents, gifts. And that parable of tells us that though God's guidance and presence is available to us, Though all of us have God's guidance and direction, there's a dimension of his dealing that is entrepreneurial. You now, what God gives you, and he wants to see what you will do. Do you understand? There's a part of I said, don't commit adultery, don't kill, don't murder. It's like absolutes. That, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a part that deals with his own unique expectation of you. Five talents is not three talents. It's not one talent. There are two different things. So God has given you something that is an element of his calling for your life. And to show that he's intentional, he came to evaluate. God is going to evaluate all of us and uh, we are preparing, you are going to prepare. So when he comes to evaluate, you have done a good job, right? Particularly for those who are called to the marketplace. Now, look at our history. I want, I want us to answer, please, because of time, answer quickly. Abraham, David, Joseph, Daniel, Philip, Apostle Paul, Saul, Samuel, Peter, Gideon. Of these 10 people, who do you think is more spiritual? Of these 10 people, any, anybody want to take a guess? Who is more spiritual? Think Abraham. Abraham, she just said Abraham. Any particular reason? We shall say Apostle Paul. <laughs> All right. Uh, Abraham, because the Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And Abraham yeah. is the father of faith. Thank you very much. Apostle Paul, what do you think? I contributed um, about Apostle Paul because. You know, majority of everything that happens in the Bible, even up to the impressionization of the current, you know, modern Christian though, is as a result of what Apostle Paul did. He was the one that actually gave us the penance, you know. He gave us a new way to see Christ. Actually, not that he had it to Christ, no, uh -huh. but his life itself was one that was worth and um, okay. worth studying as a true man of God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Richard. Anybody else? One more person? Yes, sir. Just okay. Okay, let's hear a lady. Okay, let's hear a lady. Then I hear Namde. Two of you. Or do have said something, but let's hear uh, Deborah. I think it's Joseph, because Joseph's life, Joseph's life from the very beginning up till the end was um. It was, it was an epistle, basically. It was yes. everything that God wants us to live. He could make impact in spiritually and also um, in the marketplace, basically, although it was in politics and it was in governance, but it, it, it made impact. And when he was tempted, he overcame um, again and again. He, even his brothers that hated him, he still showed them love at the end. So, I mean, that's, that's a whole lot. So his life was exemplary. Thank you, Deborah. Who else? 
Sir? I don't know if I can make a contribution. Okay, no, no, no. Let's take Namde. Eh? Please, please, I beg you. Everybody else who have raised uh, because of time, uh, looking at the clock, uh, send it as a message. Or oh, Namde back today. We'll not take it. Everybody else, I'll, I'll, read, I'll, read, their, I'll read their messages. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. All right. Uh, when, when I look at that history, I don't, I don't think there's anybody more spiritual because um, God doesn't call us because we were good. He just does, regardless of our doubts, our former faith, our opinion or interest or whatever shares we were holding initially before we came into recognition of him. Thank you very much. Uh, none of them is more spiritual. Like Odun said, every one of them, they're all spiritual. You know, they all fulfill God's command, like Mr. Wanda said, you know, in light of their missions. But the point I want to bring that is that some were businessmen, some were kings, some were explorers, some were mighty men, judges, some were um, administrators, and some were apostles. Do you get that, that uniqueness? Did anybody, can anybody see that? Hello. Yes. Sir. Yes. Sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. That these guys are doing different things, but my God, you cannot say that Apostle Paul was more special than Abraham or, or than David or Joseph. The reason is this: Why is your pastor more spiritual than you? Hello. Hi. Why is your pastor more spiritual than you? Okay. Can I? You can go ahead and I'm there. I think I think he's more spiritual than us when we are still relying on our human knowledge and patterning our lives just by his examples because we have, a, like you said, a certain uniqueness. So without recognition of our uniqueness, when we are still relying on the example of uh, the experiences of a human being, without, re without seeing past just that and who is behind it, we will we'll keep seeing him as more spiritual and we'll keep doubting our own, our own capacities. Okay. That's a contribution. Nice Everybody else? Nice or something. Now, Michelle, go ahead. Okay, I think they are more spiritual because that is their calling. And um, they, they, pay, they pay more attention to the things of God. Thank you very much. They, what makes them unique is that they took them, they are, they are as a calling. You took them as a business. You can go ahead, please. That is God, son. Thank you, Namde. You can go ahead. Thank you, sir. Welcome, Namde. Oh, do you want to say something? Go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah. Good evening, everyone again. So I, I just wanted to say maybe the term I won't, I wouldn't say like more spiritual, but I would say maybe because of their positional head, their positional role, they have that oversight over us, but not like more spiritual for me, and like uh, the previous speaker said. Adam, let me put it this way. The average pastor versus the average businessman who is more spiritual. Can I help? Yeah, go ahead, Namdu. Okay. 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 I, <laughs> how will I put this? I think that. Okay, that we can't say more spiritual, but we can say something like this: uh, maturity in Christ in that, the calling. That's what, that, that, that's what we mean by spiritual. Spiritual is that you are not carnal. Okay, me, uh, not as you are seeing dreams. <laughs> All right. that you are not doing things by the flesh. You are doing things by the spirit. You are led by the spirit. You meditate on what you are doing. You ask God. You pray. You you make decisions. Get it by the Holy Spirit and not, not just by money, right? Yes, or, or what who it will benefit. You are led by the Holy Spirit. That's what you mean by to the spiritual. Sorry, I did not define that. Thank you, sir. Uh, that shares so, a that, that, because of time, these men 
though in, in different fields, experience nearly the same level of Holy Spirit relationship and guidance. And that is what we're supposed to be experiencing too, if we take business as a mission, particularly if we are called to the marketplace. In other words, you are seeing God in dire assignment. Colin is living before the audience of one. Always Guinness. Always it. You know that everything we do is for the glory of God. Everything. Archbishop William Temple put it even more better. I said, worship is the submission of all our nature to God. It is the quickening of conscience by his holiness. Knowledge of mind by his truth. Prefer of imagination by his beauty. Open of a heart to his love. Submission of will to his purpose. All this gathered up in adoration is the greatest of all expressions of which we are capable. Note, conscience by his holiness, mind by his truth, imagination by his beauty, heart to his love, will to his purpose. This is worship. This is what it means to be led by the Holy Spirit. That you are, your will is lost in God. Your conscience is purified and quickened by his holiness. Your mind is not by his truth. And your imagination is purified by his beauty. And your heart is open to his love. So we are all called to worship. You may not have been called to the fivefold ministry, but you have been called to worship. God is seeking another worship. And we're saying, can you take your business as worship? Can you take your work as a worship? Because you can't. It's a choice. God has blessed us uniquely. Life of faith can be lived as a farmer with as much relevance and recognition in sight of God as an ordained person. Like less than 20 minutes more. Thank you. Thank you. Dear. Thank you. We should, look, we should look to Abraham and we are called to operate within the marketplace. When we lack this sense of calling, we venerate the clergy and the essence of the late. We make the clergy look holy and we are not holy. Then you hear God come and talk to us. The church wraps itself up with a pious enclave. The church loses its public influence. What I call the triumph of the bushel. Now say, don't put a lot of the bushel. But if you do that, bushel has triumph. The world takes over various areas of influence. We have a generation that does not know Joseph. We receive a religion that has lost its power. We fail to give our task the commitments they truly deserve. Because if I see business as a mission, I don't plan to fail. Do you understand? Even if I fail, I rise again. <laughs> because it's a mission, right? <clears throat> now, I want to round up with this question. My time is almost done. Um, so I want to ask us this question. Ah, simple. Why is this kettle boiling? People are going to give me different answers. As reach um, uh, boiling point, the steam is uh, evacuating. Many answers. What about this question? I get the kind of answer that, that the heat is hitting the kettle. The kettle is now boiling. You know, all those beautiful answers. The temperature, the water has reached critical uh, boiling point, 100 degrees Celsius, and it's now uh, 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 evacuating. Fantastic. My answer is boiling because somebody wants to drink tea. So, someone wants to take their bath. Mm. That is why the kettle is boiling. But you can tell me no, but these this other things you also said are true. I say yes, they are true. But can you see that these two answers are not contradictory? Right? Nambi, can you see that? Sir. I want to drink tea. That is why the kettle is boiling. But the kettle is also boiling because the, 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 the heat is hitting it and it has evacuated, right? Two good reasons. Yes, but they are not contradictory. Are they? No, they are not. We call that mechanism and agent. The agent is me that wants to, to water, that want tea. Mechanism 
is the, the process of getting into board. Abby? Yeah. <laughs> so that, that, that's all right. That, that's what this, this lecture is about. This whole EMP is about that the kettle wants to must buy, but hey, you must put the water, put the fire, put everything, you know, burn it for 100 degrees, going to burn. So we call it heart and art. Your heart, you that is exactly what you want to do. The art, how you will do it. So people get lost about Pascal Church people. Get lost with oh God will do it, God will do it. Yes, God wants the kettle to boil. You get that. God wants you to prosper. But how will you prosper? You got to put the kettle on the fire. I must bought 100, 100 degrees Celsius. That is no other way. Can I can I say something? Yes, and I'm the guy. So does it go with this saying that create without action is doesn't make sense? Mm. That's what we're saying. Okay. So we are discussing yeah. faith in the marketplace now. Oh my god. How do you exercise faith in the marketplace? This lecture is, is, is about, that, that what it's all about. How do you get the cattle to board? So don't tell us that you, God wants to bless you. God wants to bless you. Yeah, God wants to bless you. Well, hey, uh, the God that we are hearing you. Sorry, God, wants to bless you. God wants to bless you, but how will he bless you? That's to get to work. Right? So both. Yes, so the grace of God, his will, is not in doubt. The mechanism with which he works in man is not in doubt. Listen, which of their both is in doubt? Which one are you doubting? Which one do you think is problem? The will of God for our lives or the mechanism? Both are not in doubt. Both are critical. So I said it before, a bishop is an overseer who exerts influence over people in academia, spiritual organization, government, businesses, government resources, treasuries are bishops. And I will not to say, if a man, that should be if a man, that's a mistake. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. If that is your goal, to be an overseer in the marketplace, to be an overseer for God, it's a noble task, and God is happy with you. And your stakeholders, God, you, your neighbors. Who is your neighbor? Jesus Christ told the parable of the neighbor. He said, Good Samaritan. The neighbor is not the person closest to you. The neighbor is not the person of the same religion as you. The neighbor is that person that your action or inaction can influence positively or negatively. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. God bless thank you. Thank you, sir. God bless you, too. Thank you so much, sir. Any question or observations? So, uh, Odun, please go ahead, Odun. Raise your hand if you have a question, please. Okay. Odun, you can unmute your mic if you want to say, okay, no question. Okay, sorry about that. Any question? Deborah, over to you. And Maurice. Things from there, you know. Um, can we take uh, one or two feedbacks from anybody that wants to tell us what was what stood out for them? Is did anything stand out differently? I mean. Some of these things are not necessarily new. Some of them are coming in new. And some of them are things that probably you've known before and are just standing out. So do you want to share? Does anybody want to share? Yes. You can raise your hand. Okay, okay. Uh, yes, please should go I ahead. talk or test? Which? Uh, I can speak or test. Which is it? Sorry. Yes, you can speak. Please go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. So I, what stood out for me is that uh, I can't really actualize anything, even if it's a dream. I can't really actualize it till I wake up from it and start putting it to work. I'll start working in faith towards it. 
that's it. Okay. Great, thank you. What else want to tell us? Does anybody else want to say something? What stood out for them? Oh, okay. Um, right now, 